I don't think many people at your at the firm that you're soon to be leaving even realize that you have a strategy as part of. Uh, I would say I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> our 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 Gips compliance people do. They know. They know about it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jim O'Shaughnessy, and welcome to Infinite Loops. Sometimes we get caught up in what feel like infinite loops when trying to figure things out. Markets go up and down. Research is presented and then refuted, and we find ourselves right back where we started. The goal of this podcast is to learn how we can reset our thinking on issues that hopefully leaves us with a better understanding as to why we think the way we think and how we might be able to change that to avoid going in infinite loops of thought. We hope to offer our listeners a fresh perspective on a variety of issues and look at them through a multifaceted lens, including history, philosophy, art, science, linguistics, and yes, also through quantitative analysis. And through these discussions, help you not only become a better investor, but also become a more nuanced thinker. With each episode, we hope to bring you along with us as we learn together. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode of Infinite Loops. Jim O'Shaughnessy is Chairman and Co-Chief Investment Officer of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, where Jamie Catherwood is an associate. All opinions expressed by Jim, Jamie, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Well, hello, everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with another edition of Infinite Loops. And today I am very excited to have an old friend on. We share a passion and the passion is our love of tiny stocks, micro cap stocks that virtually every professional and many amateur investors simply don't even look at. And guess what happens when most investors don't look at an entire category? Lots of alpha hides down there. My guest is Ian Castle, the founder of the Microcap Club, which is a community of hundreds, thousands. Where are we at? It's now? about thousands? it's about a thousand. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome of uh, investors. Where you discuss uh, U.S. and Canadian microcap uh, stock opportunities. Uh, you also have a ton of educational content, which I think is always better, especially when you're talking about real stocks that have real earnings and, and real numbers, and it's not a price to magic. Uh, you're also the founder and CIO of Intelligent Fanatics Capital Management. I love that name. You had me at Fanatics. Welcome, Ian. Thank you, Jim. It's an honor to be here. You know, I think uh, I think I tweeted out earlier today, a lot of, I don't know if a lot of people realize that you're a microcap fan um, yeah, like I, I don't think I don't think many people at your at the firm that you're soon to be leaving even realize that you have a strategy as part of. Uh, I would say I'm there. <laughs> well, our 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 Gips compliance people do. They know. They yeah. know about it. <laughs> well, you know, let's get in. Let's get into that. That's a really great jumping off point. So, I have loved microcaps, as you know, for a long, long time, and and the reason that I love them. Uh, we share many of the same reasons, but for me as a quant, like the the they're they're the perfect asset class for for a quant, right? Because a virtually nobody follows them. Uh, many of the stocks that we have in our microcap portfolio have no analyst coverage at all, none, zero. So no nobody is like looking at you know the numbers. Do these make sense, et cetera? Um, almost zero institutional investors, and that's because like, well, you know, not to not to get too put too fine a point on it, but it, it's hard to make money if you're offering a micro cap fund because uh, literally your capacity is is really super constrained if you want to trade these in size. And we'll get to liquidity in a minute because I think for our conversation and what people are going to hear from you, it's a real advantage for an individual investor. But guys like me, you know, we did a, a study when we first started. Uh, talking aggressively about this, despite them not realizing that we have this strategy. I did, and I talked about it. But you know, we we looked at the liquidity, and you know, if you were trying to 
put $10 million say, which is a tiny amount for an institutional investor like us, but which is a significant amount for most individual uh, investors. In the most liquid, you're looking at basically five basis points of uh, impact, market impact. In the least liquid category, where we find most micro caps, you're looking at about 220 basis points of market impact. Now, we've gotten better at our trading strategies, and I know that I want to hear from you about what you've got up your sleeve there as well. But you know, this is just such a great marketplace because no one's paying attention. We we actually wrote a paper about using uh, this strategy as a uh, proxy for private equity. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of significant advantages. But tell tell me a bit about how. First off, for people who don't know you, how how, how did you fall in love with microcaps? You know, I, I fell in love with microcaps back when I was a teenager, and to date me, that would have been the the mid to late 1990s during the dot com bubble. And my parents had saved for me approximately twenty thousand dollars for my my college education. They pulled me aside when I was a sophomore in high school and said, "You know, this is all the money you're getting. You decide where you want to go. If you want to go to a more expensive university, that's fine. You you know, fill the gap with debt or whatever you want to do. But this, we just thought it this time we'll just let you know, and you can make that choice." And so this was 1997, and they introduced me to their financial advisor. They said, let's just put this 20000 into an account with a financial advisor for the time being, and you can decide how you want to allocate it. And so I got to know the financial advisor, you know, and obviously this is the dot-com bubble, and he introduced me to a few technology small cap names. And I was like, all right, well, you know, you start putting your toe in, then your whole foot in, then your leg, and then you're just submerged in this. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and it was at that point in time in the market, Jim, and, and you're aware of where you know you could have stand backwards to the newspaper over your shoulder with a dart and hit a winner. You know, and that's how I was too. And so I was in three small cap tech names. And by the time I graduated, I turned that twenty thousand into hundred and twenty thousand and you know, fully caught the greed bug and said, well, what do I want to waste all this on a college education for, at least an expensive one? Let's go to a, a, a less expensive university where I could work part-time, pay for it, and then I could just continue to invest this capital. You know, And so that was right the height. And I actually started working part-time for an Edward Jones office here locally. I worked for a financial advisor and I was more or less a glorified receptionist. I was kind of a assistant to the branch office administrator and so when the bubble crashed, you know, my portfolio crashed, not only that was I got the first entree into managing other people's money because I was the one answering the phones from our thousand clients calling during the dot-com bubble crashing. And so I kind of got the best or the worst of both worlds where going into that, you know, I thought this was an easy game to play, be an investor. I thought I was going to be a broker. And coming out of that, I didn't want to manage other people's money. It's hard enough dealing with your own emotions, let alone you know, other people's emotions. And a lot of those small cap tech companies turned into micro caps, you know? And so that's kind of how I got my feet wet, if you will, with micro caps. And then from there, kind of really the, the first micro cap, which was a few months later, I, I looked at in earnest was XM Satellite Radio, which kind of was just a story stock back then. It was a micro cap. They launched some satellites up into space. They didn't have any OEM, you know, subscribers yet. You know, they were soon you know, signing up Ford and GM and now satellite radios in every car. They were later acquired by Sirius. But back then it was a story. And so I ended up um, lying and saying I was with Castle Capital, which is obviously a firm I made up. I was still in college. And I saw the CEO, Hugh Panera, was going to be speaking up in New York City. I'm in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. That's a three-hour bus ride. And so I put my senior, you know, my basically my suit for my senior photos back on. It still fit even after my sophomore year in college and went up and weaseled my way into one-on-one -on -one with Hugh Panera, the CEO of XM Satellite Radio. And, you know, really I just, my eyes were as big as saucers. I left there, the $8,000 I had left from the crash, I bought XM at $1.78 per share. And that stock was 42% held short afloat. They started signing OEM agreements like the next day, again, 100% luck. The stock rips from, from 178 to 34 in 14 months. You know, so you, I made up all back all the money and that was 150% luck. And I like to point to that story as really what kind of got me interested in the micro cap. And it was really for, and it, really the ability for me to sit across the table from a management team and actually, oh, wow, I can talk to the CEO of this company, even an idiot like me, 
you know, yes, I used coercive means to do it, but that's really what got me started with microcaps is that I could feel at least that I could get an edge by talking to the management of these companies. And then from there, being the early 2000s, a lot of the, and I think Med Faber talks about this and other people too, you know, a lot of the activity back then was on public stock message boards, especially for smaller companies. And so like Raging Bull and Yahoo Finance, Investors Hub, and that's where I gravitated. That's where people built reputations. And that's quite honestly where these types of smaller companies were discussed because they're mainly retail owned. And so that's where, you, where, where I went and kind of built up a reputation on those boards, found a couple of mentors as well. And that's where I kind of cut my teeth and learned if I lose my money over and over again and making it back and losing money and making it back. And so um, kind of from the back when, it, when I worked for the financial advisor, I know I didn't want to manage other people's money at that point in time. The goal right from that point when I was still in college was to become a full-time private investor. Uh, made that a goal and it would have been like 2001 and I was able to reach that goal by 2008 at the depths of the crisis of 2008 to kind of cut the cord of some consulting I was doing and just became a full-time private investor, just managed my own balance sheet and investments. And then three years after that, launched microcapclub.com. Um, really, I just wanted to see what other smart people in my space liked and why. You know, I wanted it to be a private community so we could feel free to discuss things a little more, more openly. Um, and so we just had our 10 year anniversary last year. Uh, we have probably 300, 400, I think of the smartest microcap investors on the planet, you know, on there discussing what they like and why. Continues to be a great resource for my investing today, just like it was when I started it. And um, it also is a great way to find talent um, because, you know, as you well know, I mean, whether it's Peter Lynch or Joel Greenblatt or Warren Buffett, they all started microcaps because that's where they could find an edge until they scale, scale down. And so you still see that phenomenon today where you see a lot of younger people that are wicked smart, they start down here in microcap as well. And so now that I manage a firm, Intelligent Finance Capital Management, Microcap Club is also a way, great way to scout talent. I mean, who are the best yeah. up and coming people in this niche of investing that uh, can, we can help grow and facilitate and you know, form something bigger. So yeah. that's a little bit of my background. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And you know, uh, it, you tick all the boxes because uh, I learned uh, the very hard way that whom the market gods would like to destroy, they first let his first investment double in a very short period of time. That's what happened to me. And I was trading options. And of course, I thought that I was, you know, God's gift to investing and that I would soon be, you know, doling out largesse to all my friends and start a foundation. And the market had a different idea. <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> I, I, I tell you what, if, if, you, if you don't know who you are, the market is a very expensive place to learn about yourself. Uh, but in hindsight, of course, that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me, right? Because uh, picking up on when you were dealing with the public, um, I had a kind of a similar experience um, where uh, we, had a, we had a great run when our, with my first company, O'Shaughnessy Capital Management. Uh, going into the dot bomb. Um, and that's when I learned that um, the psychology of investing, I'd always known it was important. First paper I ever wrote was basically uh, psychology. They didn't call it behavioral finance back then. Uh, but, and, and it led me to a kind of a second rule at our firm, which is we do not call our clients when things are going great but we absolutely spend the entire day on the phone calling clients proactively when things are going really, really shitty. Because, you know, anybody can pick up the phone, you know, and say, hey, you know, the SMID cap uh, portfolio you're invested in? Yeah, that's up 99% this year. Uh, and, you know, hey, I talk to clients. The, 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 the rubber meets the road when, when things are going really badly. Right. And, and you still have to talk to people. I look at it as you that's a time when you learn more than you will learn in any sunny time. Right. Um, and that's, you know, kind of how I always looked at it uh, from, from my perspective. But uh, let me ask you uh, uh, on the why didn't you want to initially manage other people's money? Was it was it just 
you know, you you were freaked out about your own reaction to how some of your investments were going, or uh, were there were there other things that uh, kept you from doing that? And and then obviously you went ahead and did it. So obviously something changed. Talk a bit mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, I mean, once I went through that experience during the dot com crash, I just didn't want to deal with other people. You know, I I felt like I could do this if I just concentrated and built up my own personal capital. And listen, I don't live in Manhattan. I live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, you know, where, you know, I know I could survive on $2,000 a month, you know, so I didn't need to work up to 10, $20 million where I felt like then I could, you know, I could do it on a smaller amount. Yep. Um, and so the target was within reach and it was a target where it's kind of like that JP Morgan quote, you know, go as far as you can see. And when you can get there, you'll see further. You know, I always like that that quote. That's kind of how I felt with this. And so I just kind of kept pushing towards that goal. And also knowing at that point in time, I didn't really want to make that leap to becoming a private full-time investor until my strategy has been tested through um, a bear market. And I didn't know one was right around the corner, the crisis of 2008, 2009. But it just happened that it was. And being able to invest through that environment, and I wasn't unscathed by it, but I felt like I made it through there emotionally and mentally. Um, and coming out of that, you know, kind of setting up some parameters to where, okay, I need an amount of the capital where I know I need to be able to sustain two double digit, maybe 20, 30% down years in a row. I need to have enough capital to where I can withstand that type of emotional, mental pressure on me, the ability to take to pay bills in the future and not change who I am, what my strategy is. And so a lot of it went into that type of decision and I didn't really feel like having to, to explain that to other investors. Um, and, you know, why I decided to then do it later. So 10, basically full-time private invest for 10 years, 2018, you know, 37, 38 years old, always working out of the corner of my house, which is where I am right now. Um, just feeling like, okay, I could do this the next, the rest of my life, or I could try to create something bigger and, and you know what would be the parameters for a strategy like this to bring outside capital in, in a way where I feel like I could manage it just like it was my own. And so just putting probably a year or two of thought into, into that. And also knowing this is a capacity constrained investment arena. You know, this is never gonna be a $500 million fund. You know, I guess it could be if I wanted to you know, have 1400 positions like the IWC does or something like that. But, you know, I'm a rather concentrated investor. And so, you know, deciding out of the gate with a strategy that actually put up a maximum on how much money somebody could put in, you know, like my minimum max, I had a maximum, like it was 100,000 minimum, 200,000 maximum, that's it. People were like, why won't you take more? Because I don't want more. Because I'd rather have a table with 40, you know, legs to this rather than two, where you pull one out, the whole thing falls over. You know, because I've launched as an SMA and, you know, with an SMA, you can't have restrictions or lockups. So I wanted it to be um, the type of setup to where, listen, I'm going to educate the investor out of the gate, scare them about the volatility. Hey, if we're if the market's down 30, we're down 45. If you're not OK with that, don't go past go, you know, and then setting up then from that back into that with uh, letting people get their feet wet in a small way, let them live with a strategy for a year or two, then if they want to add to it, they can, but really not taking big checks, you know? And so that worked out well because a lot of our investors and especially the first 20 or 30 or 40 investors were mainly small business centers, you know, kind of people like yourself that started a small business, they understand the volatility of small business and they gravitated to a strategy like this because they're basically investing in the, like in businesses like their own, and they understand that they understand the volatility of those types of businesses, especially. And then you lay your own stock price on top of it. And um, I find they're the best investors to have for this type of strategy. They're the type that you know, if you're down twenty or thirty percent, they do the right thing. I don't have to tell them what the right thing is, which is buy the dips if you trust it. Um, so anyway, so, I didn't mean to go down that rabbit trail. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. That that's what I wanted to hear. I mean, I have to congratulate you because for such a young guy, it seems to me that you already were incredibly wise when you were starting out. Most people aren't. Most people are kind of like me uh, who have it needed beaten into them, uh, you know, several several times. You are an idiot. <laughs> 
And, uh, you know, that kind of structure shows, uh, like, did you have investors in your life, in your family that you were able no. to learn from? So this is uh, de novo. This is just you thinking about, huh, I wonder, I like these stocks because of these reasons. I know that I probably don't want to talk to people because I'm, I'm you, you must be like incredibly self-aware. I feel like I am, but you know, maybe talk to my wife, she might say something different, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I, I feel like um, with any type of firm, even going down to the company level from the portfolio, even with your own life, it's kind of like, a, I'm more geared towards survival. Like, okay, you know, I feel like I've been a full-time private micro cap investor, which is hard enough. It's like, it's not because of, yes, I've had some big wins, but it's also because I didn't take big losses. So it's about survival. And so that's how he set up the firm to where, you know, this is a long-term game I'm playing. I'm not trying to get the next big endowment check in. I want to build a firm that, you know, is going to always be small probably, but hopefully always, you know, hopefully outperform over the long-term and yeah. where the parameters that go into that decision, especially in public, small companies, it's difficult. Yeah. Anti-fragile. Uh, yeah. With you, 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 which is so super smart, you know, it's so refreshing actually. Uh, given you know the last couple of years where everything was price to magic ratios, and like if you had even like a reasonable story, uh, you could get funding. And you know that's a that's I'm not I'm not saying people who did were stupid. They were smart, right? If the if the cost of money is zero, you're going to be able to get yeah. a lot of speculative ventures off the ground that you might not uh, have been able to. So. You know, for, for those that did and, and won, God bless. But, uh, you know, it does seem we're coming to a more introspective time uh, with, uh, you know, real numbers and, and, and analysis making a, a difference again. So that, that leads me, you know, obviously we're very different. We're quants. Um, you are a hands-on, uh, uh, fully fundamental investor. Walk me through your, your process. And, and as you do, uh, please highlight what you would think the biggest advantage, you hinted at it earlier, but the biggest advantage that you would have, say, over somebody who's a mega cap investor. And then on the flip side, like, what are, what are some of the biggest risks? What are some of the things that happened to you that probably wouldn't have happened if you weren't in, like, the, the, the unknown country of micro cap stocks where nobody else is looking either? Yeah, it's a... It's a good question. And I think, you know, even take, maybe take a step back even further. When you're looking at investing in small companies, you're either looking at small private equity, like think Brent B. Shore, you uh, small VC, you know, or public microcap. You know, two out of those three are loved. You know, private equity, everybody loves that. Everybody wants to be the next big VC. Everybody hates microcap. You know, I think we can agree with that for whatever reason. That's just the purpose. And I think a lot of that has to do with the, the, the first entree a lot of folks get into microcap is some glossy hard mailer they get in their mailbox one day that says, here's XYZ, it's going to be the next Amazon, go buy it. And I actually kept an Excel spreadsheet of the ones I received in my house. I got, I think, 58 of those over the course of four years. And 100% of them were down 98% within 12 months. You know, and I think, unfortunately, that's the first entree that most investors get into public microcap stocks, and they don't want to ever look at it ever again. And I can't blame them. Right. And, and sorry, so, but just to yeah. interject, you know, you you also have it glorified or or demonized, if you will, in movies like The Wolf of Wall Street, where yes. you know he he goes to a bucket shop, um, and a uh, bucket shop for those who aren't familiar with the term. Uh, is basically just teetering on that line of legal and illegal. And they're flogging stocks that they know are dog shit. And they're trying to get people to get all excited about a narrative that is probably mostly made up. Um, so yeah, I get that. I get that. But you wouldn't be getting that in the mail anymore now, would you? You'd be looking at websites, right? Yeah, it'd be more on the website side of things. But you know, so what I usually tell people today if they ask me, you know, if they want to get interested in microcaps, you know, I just remind them that of the 8,500 microcaps in North America, you know, Canada and the U.S., approximately 17% of them are profitable. 
And so if you just do that simple screen and look at those companies that analyze the real businesses out of that, you know, you're going to save yourself a lot of, not all of the risk, but you'll save yourself a lot of pain. Um, and which is, I kind of feel like I'm talking out both sides of my mouth because I actually got interested in microcap from a story stock perspective. You know, even the first three or four or five years of, call it my maturation as a microcap investor, I was mainly a story stock investor. I was trying to find momentum, you know, before it would come into the market. Um, but, you know, that's usually what I tell new people into the space is focus on the profitable companies, focus on the, on the, on the real companies. Um, and what you'll find when you talk to different microcap investors is, is just like talking to mid cap or large cap investors. You have different flavors, you know, on microcap club, you'll find deep value microcap investors that, you know, do screens for, you know, book value. And that's how they find ideas or, you know, things that aren't reflected properly in the balance sheets. You'll find investors that focus on life science companies. You'll put people that focus on oil and gas. I mean, it's kind of like the same thing in mid and large cap. You can find those same flavors down in micro cap. And so when, when I get asked, you know, how do you invest? You know, I, I'll, I'll tell you about the flavor that tastes good to me. You know, it's kind of the painting that I'm painting. You know, it's happened over 20 year kind of career. Um, you know, but I'm mainly, it's kind of a combination. What I, what I look for is kind of a top down, a bottom up framework. And the top down is part of it is I'm looking for a business that's in a tailwind you know, that's kind of in that industry tailwind. I think Josh Wolf talks about it as kind of one of those undeniable, you know, hours of progress he likes to talk about. I like to find them as well. It's a lot easier. It's like riding the jet stream from the West Coast to the East Coast. It's a lot easier when you're up in the air with a 200 mile per hour. You know, it takes an hour and a half off that flight. Same thing. You know, the next thing that I'm a really, really big fan of is scarcity. I love scarcity of all forms. I'm not interested in finding a business where there's another thousand other public companies that are just marketing the same product or service a little bit differently, you know, trying to gain share. I'm going to find one of ones or one of twos, especially in the public uh, ecosystem to where there's a scarcity of value of a gross situation to where it's like, you know, have a fire hose, like point it at one thing. It's just going to push it. You know, the biggest, I think, propellant of price is just scarcity you know, when, when, when the market comes after it. And that's what I want to find, you know, in the form of a great business. Um, the next is, you know, Morgan House talked about this too, is I like great stories. You know, my first five years was focused on story stocks and I love great stories, you know. Um, you know, great stories move products, great stories move employees, they move cultures, they move stocks. You know, I love to find a great story. And lastly, obviously I'm a micro cap investor, undiscovered. Uh, and for me, what that means is, you know, as micro cap, yeah, it's undiscovered from 98% of the normal investment public, but I like to find things that are 98% undiscovered from even the folks inside micro cap that focus on micro caps. Um, I love to be the first wave of discovery. You know, I don't like to be the second or third or fourth wave finding out about something. I like to be the first. And that's something that I wake up even every day to this day, I just want to find the next one first, you know, and, and even in this environment we're in today, quite honestly, Jim, there's a lot of micro caps that are down significantly, you know, 30, 40, 50, 70% that were small caps. They're now micro caps. And I have this bias and this almost against them because yeah, but they're already covered by five analysts. The institutions already know them. I can mention them to 10 of my friends. And they give me excuses why not to own them. And yeah, they might be cheaper, but they're already kind of known stories, you know, I want to find an undiscovered one where every new incremental person that finds out about that story or business is an incremental buyer. They don't give me excuse of why they aren't going to, or they have an experience with it five years ago from the previous CEO. Like I want to, I like that first wave of discovery. So that's the top down kind of framework, you know, if, if, if you will, the, the bottom up kind of four factors I look for is you know a business that can grow through a recessionary period and that is very difficult to do uh you know a business that can grow through a COVID environment can go through grow through maybe what we're going to be going through over the next one or two years you know and yes that screens out 95 percent of the businesses you'll be looking for but that's the point that's the great thing about it, being a retail investor you can be choosy um the next part of that is a balance sheet that can endure you know, that hopefully they can be aggressive when their competitors are not aggressive, you know, a balance sheet that just 
you know, basically endure and survive. The third is kind of to the point of the firm, a management team that shows signs of intelligent fanaticism. And we co-authored a couple books on that subject, actually, um, from 2016 to 2019, co-authored two books. And really, you know, I was just obsessed with trying to overlay a qualitative framework on management you know, because the smaller the company, the more important management becomes. And so let's go analyze some great leaders and how they built, you know, great businesses and see if we can learn some things. It's basically what it was. So just trying to find those, those intelligent fanatic attributes. And lastly, down to the valuation level, you know, trying to find things that I think can fundamentally, not wish or hope, but fundamentally double in three years. So 25% caters long-term. That's, that's sort of the the bogey, if you will. Hopefully more than that, maybe maybe won't hit it, but that's what we're looking for, 25%. You know, what's so funny, a couple of things. Uh, your first comment about the quality of microcap, that's like one of our lead-ins. We're like, do you know why we love this market? Because most of the stocks in it are dog shit. And we have the ability to screen out those horrible companies um, and and look at some real gems, diamonds in the rough. You know, you know all the the stories. Mm -hmm. um, I can't help myself as a quant of twenty five years. As you're going through your your points of what you're looking for, I am building an algorithm in my head. <laughs> <laughs> so well, one uh, one of the reasons you were so insightful too. I remember when you came out and spoke at our event, and that was several years back. That was a great lineup. I was reflecting on that gem. What was it? It was you. Brent Bishore, Morgan Hassel, Josh yeah. Tarasoff. I think I was just that like, was wow, a great. That was a, that was, that was, that really was a, a, and it was fun too. That, yeah, and um, I know one of the enlightening things just from our conversation several years ago, and it's something that's impacted me even today, was you know just some of the quantitative work that you've done. Um, I think Dan Rasmussen has done some work too, just about you know how you know does insider ownership matter? Does you know all of these things that. I want to matter, but it doesn't mean that it does matter. You know, if you look at the full basket of companies, um, right. and I, I appreciate that part of your 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 talk, and that's something that that I I think about quite a lot, even to this day. You know, because <laughs> I because I want I want that thirty percent owner that gets paid next to nothing, that insider buys the crap out of his stock, you know, to be the successful one, you know, but it doesn't mean that it will be, you know. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah. and and I will advise our listeners, uh, you know, pause here rewind, read the transcript. Ian just gave you some golden points on how you should look for a small company stock. Because the other thing I was going to say is what's interesting is even though that we are, are quants and you are not, you're very hands-on, our, our approach here is pretty similar in that we, we build a balanced portfolio uh, by first, as I mentioned, getting rid of all the dog shit companies, which is like the majority of the companies there. Then focusing on valuations, financial strength, things like that. But we, we half of the portfolio is screened uh, by our value composite. So these are the cheapest of cheap micro cap stocks after having made it through all of the other hurdles. So in other words, they have to have financial strength, they have to have good earnings quality, et cetera. And then we, we do the cheapest, the other half of the portfolio is momentum based. Um, people always get, this has always amused me um, w when people uh, who maybe don't like look at how we actually invest, always like call me a deep value investor. I, I'm not even close, right? <laughs> momentum, momentum works and it works really, really well, but you've got to have it combined with other things, right? And, and so that half, same, same universe. In other words, we get rid of all the bad stocks. We have focus on those with good uh, value characteristics, uh, those with uh, excellent uh, financial strength and earnings quality. But then we buy that half of the portfolio based on a multi-factor momentum screen. We like it because um, essentially it leads us to places. My ear picked up when you said you want to be first. Um, and due respect, being a quant can get you first really often <laughs> because like I, I would sometimes have a trader come to me and like they would show me the name that I was telling them to buy, right? And, yep. and, and he would say, uh, 
Jim, have did you, Jim, you ever even heard of this company? And I'm like, of course not. I'm a quant. <laughs> I said, I could, I could tell you the factors of that company. And he's like, dude, I am like, nobody that we're putting these trades out right to the, the big brokers. And they're like, what, what ticker is this? No one knows about it, <laughs> which I, which I kind of love, honestly, because like you, man, if I wasn't a quant, I would be like you. I would say, find a scarce uh, resource, right? Really scarce. Um, do lots of due diligence, find out, you know, separate the wheat from the chafe and you can do like, I call this the undiscovered market. I wrote this in 2016. My original, we started our micro cap strategy in 2006 and like, it's still not closed. And, and I'm just like, I can't believe it because like, it's, is it, is it still just your money, Jim? <laughs> mostly, I think it was like a few years ago. So yeah, just... <laughs> mo mostly, honestly, I just uh, put a little extra money into the market uh, a little bit ago uh, because you know things were getting extreme, uh, and I always, I'm never, I'm never at the bottom or I'm never at the top. But where I put it, I bet you can guess, I put it in yeah. micro caps mostly, and then I put a little bit in small value um, because. Again, these are things uh, from my point of view, it's very, it's like you said, we're looking for a CAGR of 25%. Like people who are up in big cap land, they, it's almost like they can't process that. But, but the yeah. fact is all large companies at some point were small companies, right? Yeah. And, and somebody started them in a garage or in a, rent, a shared rental office or whatever. And, and so... You know, when we look at the microcap universe, about 25% of it is new ventures. So it's brand new, right? And mm -hmm. so that possesses kind of a, there's where you would have an edge over us because if they don't have enough numbers, you know, they just don't even show up for us. Um, and 60% are kind of set st steady state. In other words, we, we go between 500 million and 250 million just because mm -hmm. on, on, I mean, honestly, and listeners if you this is not investment advice but <laughs> if you are interested in like uh an area where even uh, a small uh fund can't go look at things under 50 million how far, what's your what's your minimum on market we, we don't really have one we we actually bought something recently that is seven wow yeah, because it's it kind of gets back to you want to be first, and you, you mentioned that a couple of minutes ago, and uh, it gets back to position sizing. You know, it's like you might be first, but you might be small. You know, and that's one of the things I learned kind of over the last twenty years is, you know, a lot of times I bet big out of the gate, and I got lucky because I, you know I was right and I was lucky. You know, and over time you realize you don't have to do that. You know, you can you can bet a little bit, watch management execute, and buy more. And quite honestly, all my biggest winners were things I was constantly averaging up in, you know, not averaging down. And so that's that's sort of the process we take, you know, with with our portfolios too. Is you know, yeah, it's, it's a very small company. I just described seven million, um, but we're not. I don't ever want to be at a size where I can't buy almost anything, you know. And if something's that small. And I'm buying it. It has to have the amount of upside that it could potentially be a decent sized position if it works. Um, yeah. So it's another kind of filter or hurdle, you know, for something that small to get in the portfolio. I'm not going to add something that small if I think it's just going to be a 20%, you know, cater over the course. You know, has to have significant upside. So, um, so yeah, we like to be first, but uh, sometimes we kind of inch into positions and and wait for management to execute. I mean, we're very concentrated. I mean, quite honestly, we're in six to 10 positions. And, but we're very hands-on. Um, you know, we probably have 300 points of contact with our portfolio companies so far this year, um, just trying to understand them better than most. And that's another thing that I learned just from doing this for a long time is, you know, I, I wanna know these businesses as much as I can uh, so I can hold for the upside, but also so I can spot things when they start to turn to the negative, you know, because if I'm being honest with you, Jim, if I'm, when I look at what I owned five, six years ago, and let's say, you know, I have 
let's say I have 50% turnover in a portfolio, just pulling a number like that over five years. Let's say I've owned 50 or 60 companies, 70 companies over the last four or five years. You know, how many of them do I still own today? Maybe just three, you know, four. Yeah, this is tough. This is not something where I'm out marketing only 10% turnover. You know, we want to continuously try to find the best companies we can find. And probably more often than not, they're going to disappoint us eventually. And you, you know, filter out and filter in the next, the next batch of companies. And hopefully another five years of the 10 companies we own, two or three would have went from micro cap to small cap. And we continue to hold them. They're kind of the veterans of the baseball team. And you're constantly trying to find the new rookies that can become those next great players. And so there is turnover in a portfolio like this. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think is really cool is just like, it's kind of fun. If you go in, I don't, I, I don't uh, t talk to end investors much anymore because our clients are registered investment advisors. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but when I did, I always really enjoyed going in and just like leading with all of the downsides. Like, cause yeah. I would like, I would like, and, and some of them are shared over in small cap, right? Not to the extent they are in in micro cap, um, but like <laughs> I remember one guy like saying to me, are, "Are are you telling me you don't want me to buy? You don't want me to invest it?" And I'm like, "No, hell no! I was I invest very much in micro cap. I'm just telling you all of the things you're going to have to accept and get over." Yeah, but you know your your point about the seven million leads to the other question. Like, do you see in our portfolio? Uh, in our micro cap portfolio, the number of stocks that end up being taken over, often by like a private equity firm, mm -hmm. uh, is is huge. It's much bigger than it is in any of our other stuff, including our small cap stuff. Do you do you find the same? Have you lost a lot of names to take over? Yeah, I mean, it it's happened. It's probably going to happen more frequently now with valuations coming down too. And I, I think I remember you even commenting on a tweet I made. Um, I think a better kind of statistic to use is on Microcap Club launch 2011. Since 2011, our members have profiled, I think it's around 850 microcap companies since 2011. And we track the performance of all of those companies the day they were profiled to the end of last month. So we just have this running tally. We actually have a membership ranking based on the performance. So if I, you know, profile at a company that I like at a dollar and it goes to $2, you know, that's, it's up hundred percent. That's a hundred points. So that's like a hundred points. Similar if it goes down, it's a detractor. Um, but anyway, getting to the point of your question of the 850, I believe it's something like eight, 17% maybe have been acquired since the club was started in 2011. So it's a significant chunk of, of those companies, which is getting more and more interesting. Yeah, and, yeah. and that, that, that percentage is actually pretty consistent with what we see uh, in our strategy. Ours might, it depends on the year, but ours might even be a little bit higher. Um, and like, I look at that as, as a, a great thing. I personally, um, again, not investment advice listeners, but I personally use um, our micro cap as a proxy in my own portfolio for private equity. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, we do have, uh, an investment with Brent B. Shore, uh, but I look at that at, you know, as his name implies it permanent equity, he, he plays mm -hmm. that game very differently than other private equity investors. And I think very highly of Brent and his team. Uh, but I like this idea that they're not there to flip a company. They're there yes. to, yeah, they, 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 they are long-term partners, which leads me to the next question. Um, like. One of the things I find so cool about you, Ian, is like you are really an early adopter, in my opinion, at least. Like, you know, now we have the rage for learning public, transparency, all these things that I bang on about a lot. But you, you know, you did it, right? So you, you uh, your community is over 10 years old in the microcap uh, club. And, and you did this all in public. Um, what, what did you learn First off, because I'm always urging people to do this, right? To learn in public, especially now that um, you can be anywhere in the world and you can uh, participate with people like you and, and your club members. So there's no excuses left. It's not like you have to go to mm -hmm. a, you know, a club meeting in downtown Manhattan. Uh, you, you can do this all virtually. And so I think, you know, 
doing so in public, learning in public, being transparent. But what were some of the lessons that you learned as as you uh, uh, as this process unfolded? And again, congratulations on being one of the first like great examples of this. Well, I think I probably one of the first because I just got lucky. I remember a um, was it John Maxwell, the leadership author and speaker. He was asked. You know how we became such a successful author selling millions of books and he's, he's he made a comment like well i've written 41 books one of them has to be good or something like that. <laughs> it's like i've just been around for so long you know it's got kind of, it's got kind of the same thing with me on twitter it's like well i was on there like since 2009 so you know but no. um i i've always enjoyed learning in public and, and it probably gets back to when i started posting on stock message boards in the early 2000s where everything was just public um, and not being afraid to look dumb because we all look dumb constantly, you know? So, uh, it, and I think it's, I think it's important because I think the key is just trying to create that flywheel of serendipity in your life. And the way to do that is put yourself in uncomfortable situations where people can see your potential, you know, whether that's taking, you know, speaking at an event or writing on a sub stack or, whatever the case may be, but it's all about just trying to increase that flywheel of serendipity so good people can enter your life. I love that. I think that, you know, again, uh, the, the, the many pearls of wisdom you are giving to our listeners are you really have to pay attention. I would take notes, gang, and read our transcript. We have transcripts. What you just said just resonates so strongly with me. Um, you know, I... I sometimes joke about, um, you know, people who say everything is luck, right? Um, and I, I'll put up a, a GIF or a meme that, that says, everything is due to luck, said the most unlucky person in the world. <laughs> 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 of course, there are things that are due to luck. Absolutely. Trying to trying to be, do the opposite, if try to invert that and in saying that everything is skill is bullshit, right? And mm -hmm. there, there, it is a continuum. But I do believe uh, fairly passionately that if you put yourself in situations that might be uncomfortable for you as a person, um, your opportunity for luck increases sometimes dramatically. If for no other reason, is because there are so few people willing to put themselves in that situation, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, 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 and there are so few people willing to look dumb or willing to say, oh, I really fucked that one up. The more that you can look at that as an opportunity, as opposed to a stumbling block, it's a building block in my opinion. Because yeah. like you're there, no one else is there because they're like, no way, man. I, what would people think? And like time and again, I've had that luck, right? By just being willing to, to be uh, open to first off my own errors, like, I make mistakes all the time. And yeah. the only way, the only way that you can actually get any better is through error correction. And you, 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 you're not going to know about that. Or if you try to hide them or you try to say like, yeah, well, you know, it, it all, it, you, I love the term, the virtuous flywheel, because it depends not only on that, right. But not only on being willing to put yourself in uncomfortable situations, you've got to be aware. You've got to survey your mm -hmm. surroundings. You have to have situational awareness, but then you also have to be willing to be wrong and, mm -hmm. and, and like retain the agency. It's like, it's one of my litmus tests with people is when things go wrong, are they pointing fingers? Oh, it was his fault or her fault, or it was the situation or the market was wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. You were wrong. And I don't care mm -hmm. what the situation was. It Maybe a lot of other people were wrong too, right? Maybe you were the only one who was wrong. Yeah. The fact is though, that if you retain that agency, it's what I like about you and, and like why I've always been interested in following your career is like you personify, at least for me, a lot of these, a lot of these characteristics in a person and like you can, you can make your own luck, but you first off, you got to be aware that that's possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. You just have to put yourself out there. I remember, I remember the first time I really got asked to speak somewhere it was back in maybe it was 2015 now, uh, asked to speak out at Google. 
And I was honored that anybody even would care. And it, but it really scared me because it was like, you know, I've got to go out there and speak. And I'm not like you, Jim, where, okay, so another sidetrack story. Jim comes out and speaks at our event. I think it was five minutes before he was going on stage at our summit. And he's just like, so what do you want me to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> he just gets up there and gives a, a brilliant presentation of microcap off the whim, you know, for about an hour straight. I was like, and I just remember looking at Mike and my partner, Mike, and I'm like, did he just do that? I was like, I could not do that. So anyway, but I remember when I was speaking out at Google, you know, I, I mean, I bet you I practiced that presentation 150 times. You know, it's kind of like, why does Roger Federer's backhand look effortless? Because he practices it a thousand times a day, you know, and so you know, everything that looks smooth and natural or whatever, usually there's a ton of preparation behind that. And so the way you get over putting yourself out there is just over preparation, over preparation. Um, and just doing it more, more, more. So, so how do you respond? Like what happens if somebody comes up after like your Google talk, right? And they come up and, and they say, I, I just think that's all bullshit, man. I just think that you're wrong here, you're wrong here, you're wrong here. Uh, how do you handle people? How do you handle very negative people like that? Uh, I'm not a very, I'm very passive aggressive. Uh, my <laughs> wife would, have, you know. So I nor I normally would just say well, that's fine. You know, this isn't for everybody, and move on to the next. You know, I, I, that's right. usually how I react to things. Like I'm not interested in getting into arguments with people that have already made up their minds. You know, exactly. So, and again. Like we could do a commandment list from this, from this <laughs> thing, because it's like, I will talk to people who I see fighting with people who are, you never ever, like, I already passionately believe that I cannot change another single human being. I can help them if they want to change, but I, Jim, can't change you, Ian. You, Ian, have to want to have some kind of change or not want it or whatever, like if you don't want it, it's never going to happen. Can't be forced on you. Uh, it, we can compel you if if mm -hmm. we have guns and authority. Yes, we can compel you to do a certain thing, but it's not you changing. It's you complying. And and like that was a hard lesson for me to learn as a young person because when I when I was younger, I was a real proselytizer. And like when I, when I found something that I thought was like really like oh man, this is really cool. I got to tell everybody about this, right? And and so I did, right? I just proselytized, proselytized, and and I realized it's. Not, I I still think there's a place for being a voice for a certain set of principles, being a voice for a certain set of ways to invest, like we're talking about right now. But I waste zero time on anyone who is just clearly made up their mind, and I'm just God. Good luck. You know, mm -hmm. it's it, and and so luckily over time, that ability to be incredibly dispassionate about like most things <laughs> is and and but and yet still driven by this passionate obsession with like how did that work? I really want to figure out how that works, and mm -hmm. and so I just think you know if. If somebody who's listening is not an investor and you, you're still listening anyway, you just got a fantastic lesson for me, which is somebody comes up to you and says, you know, you're wrong and I'm right. You just say, oh, yeah, yeah, probably right. See ya. <laughs> yeah. I, I and, don't and think most, that's, go. And, and, and most people, I mean, especially in investing, if you take a logical approach, and we, we kind of hit on a few things already, but you know, even when it comes to microcap investing, I, the investors I talk to, it's not like I want nobody be, should, should be putting, except for me <laughs> way back when, should be putting 100% of their money in micro cap stocks, you know? Right. And sa same thing with people that are investing with me today. I'm like, you know, this should be like 5% of your portfolio or less so that you could stomach the volatility that's inherent in these securities, you know? Um, and so I think as long as you're just honest and forthright about your investment approach, I know we're, this goes over and above investing, but it was just something I was thinking about as you were talking. Um, I think all you're left with with people that just want to disagree with you or people that have other motivations. So, absolutely, and you know I call them psychic vampires, and like if you just don't respond, they go elsewhere, right? Yeah. It's like trolls are are being trolls for very different reasons, usually unfortunate and sad reasons. Honestly, another thing yeah. that I've learned as I've gotten older in life is. I have become far more forgiving of human fragility 
And we're listen, man, we're all running the same human operating system here. There's a bingo point for the nice lady who did the infinite loops bingo. Um, and like we all are. And you don't know what, so, like people on Twitter say to me, why do you mute instead of block people? And I'm like, the reason I do that is because maybe 20% of those people were just having a bad day. Mm-hmm. And and like to to like ban them and banish them from yeah. ever darkening your doorstep again just seems to me to be limiting your own ability to learn from other people, right? Like I've had lots of bad days and said lots of stupid things, and like that's part of being a human being. And and so I I just tend to focus on this idea like if somebody's being a real asshole, it's just like they're probably in pain from something that I don't know anything about. And so I'm not gonna wish them ill. I'm not, I'm just gonna just say, I can't help you, sorry. And hope yeah. that, yeah, right? Hope that they that they come along. Let's no, go I'm, back. I'm a, I'm a big fan oh. of the mute button. Mute button in life, mute button on the TV, you know, as a way to focus and just cut out distraction. And I think you said it perfectly. A lot of times if you're gonna react, it would have been probably in such a negative way. You never know if that would influence them in a negative way that, you don't want that on your conscience either. So it's just easier just to say, you know, that's fine. Just move on. You know? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I'm not a religious person, but I really do believe in karma. And, and I believe that, you know, you, the more good karma you put out, it'll come back probably not from even the same people. Um, it doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's not specific, but like vibes, I think, you know, uh, we we're a social creature. We human beings. I mean, just look at this lockdown. And all of the problems that happen from that, so just because we're social and like we need other people, we need to yes. actually be able to be engaged with other human beings. And, we weren't and we weren't meant to do life alone. Let's put it that way. No, we absolutely yeah. were not. We absolutely were not. Um, let's let's bring it back to um, the investment process. So, do you have like a a kill switch? Is there anything? Um, in your process that let's say you found the company, it meets all the criteria that you've just previously explained. Um, do you have either a quantitative or a qualitative um, thing that is like, yep, nope, we're selling that today? Uh, management line to me or management integrity, anything on the management side. You know, when you're, whether it's a public or private business, you know, management is so important. And what I found over the years is grade B, grade C, God forbid, grade D management, they're not going to be able to put all those pieces together. And that's what these businesses are. They're putting pieces together and putting the right people, processes, culture in a way that can hopefully scale. And B, C, D management can't do it. You know, you got to focus on the A. It doesn't mean you're going to be right all the time if you have A management. Um, But when I sit down at the poker table, you know, I like to get a full house and play that full house, not you know, pay it off suit, you know, so it's, you're just trying to keep the stack the odds in your favor. So for me, when I see management integrity or self-dealing, or if they do a deal and they personally take 5% of it, or, you know, even, I don't even like to see, you know, where the, the owner owns the building, the business is operating, and they lease it or rent it back to themselves, you know, just little stuff like that kind of trigger, you know, just the, you know, put the alert up. And so a lot of times it's more to do on the management integrity, honesty, fair dealing, um, you, know, you just want to see good people, you know, people that, and a lot of times what triggers us to an idea is kind of the opposite of that, seeing a management team, um, insider buying, um, investing directly into the business. You see a transformation, a rights offering, which is basically a management or shareholders reinvesting into the company, trying to spot those transformations before other investors, where it was an older business, now it's being transformed. Maybe they sold off subsidiary, refocusing on a growth area. Those are the things that get us interested. Yeah. Kind of the opposite of that question. Yeah. And and so um, have you had any experiences where you went, because I know you're a very hands-on guy, um, where, where you went and then you later discovered that they were just lying through their teeth to you? Even as recently as the last six months, you know, there was a, one of our positions that was saying one thing and doing another. And it's really hard because, you know, I'm a big fan of journaling like you are, you know, because I like to write down what I'm thinking, feeling, what I'm thinking about doing. Um, and 
you know, it's hard, sometimes it's hard to pull out the lessons from those because it was, it ticked all the boxes, except I didn't realize I was dealing with a liar. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it's difficult, you know, but yeah, it's still, it still occurs, but this is, you know, it's a, it's a game of batting average, even, you know, I'm not right all the time. And I know that, you know, it's yeah. just, yeah. Well, yeah, I agree. And that's why I'm such a huge fan of base rates, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, you should never look, in my opinion, um, you don't have to be a quant to think like this. You should never look at the outcome of a single investment. And, and you know, my friend Annie Duke calls that resulting. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like you, you could have had a bad reason for making that investment and it could have worked out in your favor. Then you've doubly compounded your problem because you're you're saying, oh, look at me. I'm so smart. I invested in this. And the reason I did, not you don't know this, but the reason I did was wrong. And yet mm -hmm. I had a good income, uh, good outcome. Whereas it's like, I don't know, would you would you like be satisfied with a single snapshot um, of uh, a business or would you want to see a movie of that business? That's what a base rate is, right? Uh, it's it's that business going up and down over different market cycles or strategy rather, better mm -hmm. way to look at it. That investment strategy is, and you're going to see some real divots, right? It's like people on, on Twitter, they, they, I, it seems like it's almost a trope, but it's like, you will never see a bad back test. And I'm like, uh, I can show you thousands of bad back tests, right? And, and like, even on ones that we use, there's a, <laughs> there are a yeah. lot of like really edge of your seats. People are throwing up the scary volatility. So I, I look at that as like a real advantage in terms of what's my batting average? Because like if if I hit a home run and then point to that and you videotape me hitting a home run, by the way, in my case, you would never get that on videotape because <laughs> I would never be able to hit a home run. But let's just say I did. And and I walked around showing it to everyone at a party and said, look, this is this is me. This is how I bat. Right. It seems so obvious when you put it in that regard. One of the things that I've found is very helpful is that when you can make it relatable to another human being. Numbers are like, even I, I said basis points earlier. And I'm, you know, my bad, I probably shouldn't do that. And I think that one of the things, now granted, most of the people who are gonna be listening to this are people who are really interested in investing um, and they know what basis points are and they know all of that. But you know who's really good at this? Morgan Housel, he, you know, the psychology of money I always say price follows narrative, and I know that bothers Morgan, but it's true for the most part. And and yet, if you're trying to teach somebody about like, what are the basics? You do a very good job mm -hmm. of it, even though your specialty is the micro. Uh, but like, tell stories that people can relate to, right? And they're like, yeah, I get that. I understand that. Um, do you see yourself uh, as like, is that, is is there part of your career unfolding because you're still young is there part of it where you would like to teach to like explain to people who really need the help how to yeah how to that, I, mean, I definitely see that it would probably still stick to my niche of investing i mean one of the reasons why i put so much effort especially in the early years in the micro cap club on the education side was especially back then it was even it was a lot worse than it was today. Just the negativity, that negativity light that was shining on microcap at that point in time. Cause that was 2011, 2012. And that was right when the reverse mergers ended. That was right when some China reverse merger frauds came out. I'll go back even further. So previously to 2011, we had about 500 reverse mergers a year that were done. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of people don't talk about that much, even in any papers, when they talk about the amount of public companies going down over the last you know, 15 or 20 years. Well, that funneling of 500 new companies a year ended in 2010, 2011. And that's a, that's a big amount of companies to be added to the public ecosystem just in the US that just stopped. That went from, I think at its peak, 800 reverse mergers. And I think it's still, might, you might get 100 a year. So that's a big gap to fill. And so there was a lot of negativity around that because of the, the amount of China frauds that were going public through reverse mergers. So we put a lot of emphasis on just trying to be a positive shining light to the ecosystem of microcap. Um, 
because I love the space. You know, a lot of other people love the space, but you never heard anybody say anything good about it. And so, (laughs) you know, so a lot, so a lot of the time was just as kind of leading microcap club, just trying to create a brand that was a positive force and also trying to expand microcap out even through our events, through our networking, like bringing somebody like you to speak, bringing somebody like Morgan Housel or Brent B. Shore, the types of, the types of folks where people looking at it be like, what are these guys speaking at a microcap event for? You know, a crappy little microcap event, you know? That's the reaction I want when people come to the event, like bring people in, like what's going on over there? You know, bring yeah. quality, attract quality of all forms into the ecosystem. So that's, that's definitely a top one or two thing that gets me going every morning. It's just trying to continue to push that, you know, even after 10 years. Um, and obviously education is a big part of that. And just doing, you know, great podcasts like yours, just trying to continue to do that. Luckily today, I mean, it, it, it's not as bad as it, it, as it was, but, um, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's another thing that I really uh, is one of my kind of um, rules, which is I would much rather root for something than root against something. I mean, there's just like so many people who are going to root against things that that th- again, here we are. We're over here on the scarcity side of things saying, hey, look at how cool this is. And it just seems that like I think pessimism often sounds smart and optimists make money. Right. And mm-hmm. Like I, I myself don't quite understand the mindset of a pessimist. Like to me, these are people who don't understand human history, who look, human history is a lot, a lot of horrible things that happened in it, uh, but they, they don't dominate really. If you, if you look, yes, horrible hundred year wars, <laughs> horrible mm-hmm. uh, uh, targeting civilians, uh, using mustard gas. I, I, the list is endless, right? But, you know, we, we continue to dust ourselves off and, and things continue to get better. Like most people don't know that something like a billion people emerged from poverty over the last 15 years. I mean, yeah. this, like, that is unbelievably Insane. cool. Yeah. You don't see that in the news headlines. I mean, it, and that's, yeah, the sad, as you know, like 98% of news headlines are negative, And that's why. You know, if there's any news junkies out there, they're usually miserable people, you know, because 98% of news is negative. But no, I I agree. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I want to ask you about a tweet that you actually had pinned. I don't know if you still do, because I didn't look today, but you tweeted on May 11th, and and you were talking about micro and macro economic factors, and and you said they look troublesome. Um, And so I don't I don't really look at macro at all. Um, do you do you bring that into your process? Yeah, it, I posted that to Microcap Club. I sent it out to our all our members and uh, that are part of the community. You know, just uh-huh. because the Microcap space has been going through kind of a a drawdown and just trying to create an anti fragile mindset as well as a portfolio. And um, I kind of wrote that in a journal and then I sent it out to everybody and I got a pretty good response from it. But it was mainly centered around and if if you read if you read through the whole thing, it's basically the fact that I really don't pay attention to macro factors, but it's hard not to you know during a drawdown because you're always looking for excuses of why you're down so much, and I <laughs> and, and I could find myself even thinking, you know, over the last six months, there's probably no other time I can think of where I've thought more about interest rates, more about inflation. Not like I actually thought about it, but just kind of front and center of my mind, more about inflation, more about Elon Musk, more about, you know, a bunch of other, you know, things that really aren't going to matter in the end. And instead of that, invert that and find companies where all that stuff doesn't really matter. And what I find is when I think more and more about macro, I get more and more short-term minded. And, um, and that's one of the big, I think, negatives about drawdowns is, you know, when you see your portfolio going down every day, you don't want to lose money, any more money. So you start, you know, making irrational decisions. You start, if you're a concentrated stock picker like me, you start micromanaging your positions too much. It's like, yeah. a, you know, I, I kind of figure as a concentrated investor, you're like your positions, you should hold them like a tube of toothpaste. You can't squeeze them too tight. Uh, you got to let them breathe a little bit because these aren't perfect companies either. And so a lot of times you're like, you know, what do I think they can earn next quarter? That's not how I invest. But that's what you start thinking because you don't want to be down another 20%, you know, (laughs) if they report a bad quarter. 
because you're just you're already down 20 percent. so i mainly wrote that just to kind of frame up a, a, a scenario it's just to get people to think clearer that always think out two three years not to the next quarter yeah well that's great advice i i agree uh, i think that you know temporal arbitrage is a real thing and yeah. uh like i i i Day to day in the market, I don't have a, you know, even when I was still, when we were all still going to the office, I didn't never had a Bloomberg in my office. I never had a TV in my office. I had Bach playing all day long. And like, it's so much better for you. It actually, in my opinion, it centers you far better because you're not overreacting. Because mostly, in my opinion, like if you're reacting to something that happened today, that's pure noise. And, you know, over five, 10 years, that noise might turn into a signal. That's right, of course. Um, but it might not. Most noise mm -hmm. doesn't. And so temporal arbitrage is really simple. You're arbitraging time. I always say to young people, you are time billionaires. And you should take advantage of it. Like, you, you know, this is such a precious gift you have right now. And a lot of people didn't do it and like they're hurting now and, and you, you can you can do that. So I, I love the idea. I, I'm also reminded of what PJ O'Rourke who died recently, sadly, um, said uh, the quote was something like this. Um, Microeconomics is what economists are specifically wrong about. Whereas macroeconomics <laughs> is what economists are wrong about in general. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, and, and, and it's so true. And, I, and that's where you get into trouble because as a stock picker, which is what I am, when I start turning myself into a market strategist, that's it's just not beneficial because even professional market strategists are wrong more than half the time. So what am I going to do about it? So I, that's why I like to just boil it down to keeping a two or three year time frame and a drawdown. If I think my businesses can grow, earn more money and not dilute me over two years, there's nothing to do. Bingo. And yeah. like, you know, it's, it's, it's people, um, you know, don't confuse as ben, ben Goodspeed, who wrote the, the Dow, T-A-O, that I talk about a lot, the Dow Jones averages way back in the dark ages, I think of the late 70s, but he had this great quote, which is, don't confuse activity with effectiveness. And like some of the most effective people that I know are not like running around with their hair on fire. As a matter of fact, Everyone that I would put into the category of super effective people that I've had the pleasure of meeting or working with are the opposite of that. It's just mm -hmm. like, okay, we'll see, you know, the Taoist farmer, right? We'll see, we'll see. It's just a better way, in my opinion, to, to lead your life. Um, we're bumping up, I can't believe it, but we are bumping up against uh, some of our time constraints. I wanted to get a chance to ask you about the uh, article that you wrote uh, which you titled, What is Chasing You? And and you said in it that fear continues to chase you. Talk, talk to us about that. I found that really interesting. Yeah, I wrote that article, I think a couple of years ago now, I'm trying to remember. And it, it was one of those, and you write quite a bit, there's, there's certain things that just kind of fall off your pen or keyboard very easily. And that was one that just kind of streamed out of me. But it was just one of those posts that I was reflecting on kind of my, not only career, but my life up to this point, and just thinking about the the ebbs and flows of that, and just how things change, you know, from where you just want to be successful to where you want to be a good husband to now, you know, even the, the I think the stage where that ended was be a great father, you know, and kind of that last stage where I was at, when I ended that article was, you know, there, as human beings, and me personally, there's, I'm definitely inadequate in certain ways. I know areas where I need to get better and I have young kids, six and four. And so what chases me is just like, I still have time to change who I am before they know who I really am. Kind of like one of those things, like I can still change, you know, these huh. areas, you know, cause they're not old enough to know where I'm delinquent yet, you know? <laughs> and so that's kind of how I, how I left it off. You know, we all have those vices <laughs> where, you know, all right. Soon enough, they're going to be old enough to see that dad's like this way. And I, I got to change that, you know, and I'm self-aware about that. <laughs> so that was I that love, fear, you know. <laughs> I love that. Sadly, uh, I'm at the stage where I'm trying to hide those things from my grandchildren now, rather yeah. than my children. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but I, but I find that oftentimes that's why my grandchildren like about me. <laughs> like, yes. Papa, you just laugh all the time and you're so funny. <laughs> like you know, I think you and I are a lot are a lot that way. It's like I still like, and you don't see yourself. You're, I think, you said you're 62. You know, I'm 41, and you know, I still think of myself as that 23 year old. And I only see myself older is when you see your kids, or in your case, your grandkids getting older. You know, that's the yeah. only time I I really acknowledge Father Time is by seeing <laughs> them getting right. older, not myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was funny. My wife and I were talking about it the other night, and I said, you know. Patrick, who it, I was 24 when Patrick was born, my oldest, and uh, when he turns 40 in three years, uh, that will freak me out more than him, <laughs> because yeah. like I'll have a 40 year old son. I remember when I was 40, <laughs> and it doesn't yeah. seem like that long ago, right? <laughs> it doesn't. And, <laughs> and and but my wife, being the the voice of reason, said, "But the upside, we're the same age." She said, but the upside is we'll only be 64. So when you get up into this air, area of age, 62, 64, zero difference, no difference at all. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's like, even, even me, I'm, you know, when you were 20, you thought somebody was 40. Oh, they're old. Now that, exactly. you're, now that you're 40 or even 60, it's like, well, 80's not old. What are you talking about? You know, my, <laughs> my, 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 my mother used to say, um, that old is always whoever is 10 years older than you. <laughs> Yeah, true, <laughs> true. <laughs> oh man. Okay, so uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, thank you for sharing. All I mean, like we, th this is one where I bet the transcript gets a lot of reads because you you gave a really clear, concise, and intelligent uh, way to to I think will help investors who are like not quants like me and saying you can't handle the algorithms and you don't have to. That's another thing I've changed my mind about. It's like, there are a million paths to heaven. And the, the important thing that you've got to do, in my opinion, is find what's right for you. And like, read a lot, read as much, listen to podcasts like this, note what, um, what, what, what resonates with you, write it down, get a process. That's important, I think. Um, but make that process something that's right for you, right? And, and that's your way to succeed, in my opinion. You're not going to succeed by aping somebody else, I don't think. Uh, yeah. Because, I, they, you know, it's just you're inauthentic to yourself. Yeah, I view it as a and, – and it's great to hear you say that because you're a quant. Like, I, I view it very much like an art form, especially if you're getting into stock picking, too. It's I view kind of the way – I view my maturation as an investor of like a canvas, when I started out as investing, I was a story stock investor. And so that was one shade of paint. And then I actually got into precious metals and junior exploration stocks for three or four years. And I kind of learned how to do that. And really in 2008, nine, I started focusing on GARP uh, type of scenarios and then life sciences. And, and today, you know, the portfolio is an eclectic mix of all those things. It's all these colors dispersed and my painting's not done yet. You know, I really hope that I'm not investing the same way five years from now, you know, but it's going to have shades of color from the past all intertwined in that painting, but it's mine. It's my painting. You know, it's not for somebody else. It's, and I think everybody else's investor investment journey, you know, it's similar to that. Yeah. I love that metaphor too. We, we did pretty well with a thing called canvas. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I'm but, not but, being paid to, uh, yeah, <laughs> to say canvas. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 actually, you know, that's true even for quants, right? So we, I mean, if you looked at the first version of my book and you look at the current version of the book, they're very different. Same foundational things, yeah, but we found better and better ways to get at things like value, to get at things like financial strength. So we're continually evolving as well. We just paint in a different, you know, in a different yeah. kind of painting, right? And, um, you know, that was always one of the little things that I always wanted to do was like commission a, a mural or a group of canvases with uh, the theme being the history of the ideas of progress. And if you did it, I think it's like one of those things, like you said, if you were looking at your painting, you can see how you grew and changed as an investor. And I love the metaphor because yeah, that's what we do. That's all of us do that, right? 
and and to be aware again self awareness and you are very self aware which kudos um is like don't be a, you say fear is always chasing me but you're aware of that right like yeah <laughs> you know the, it's the people who are afraid i'm not afraid come on man human beings are emotionally based creatures and the emotion at the at the core level of our programming is fear Mm -hmm. And and so unless you understand and can deal with that, it's always going to keep biting you. And so I'm, I, you know, look at you, Mister Self Aware. My God, you're gonna are you gonna ascend? You're gonna be a, come enlightened. <laughs> I don't think and so. That, that, that's gonna be your final thing. Your kids will be like waving and say, "Daddy, come on, wait." <laughs> I doubt that. Like I said, you talk to my wife, she might give you a different perspective. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 You know, whenever anyone gives me like a, a very puffery uh, introduction, I'm like, will you come and introduce me to my wife of 40 years, yeah. please? Because exactly. she, she doesn't see things that way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, my friend, we have a, a standard question we give everyone at the end of this, um, where we're going to wave a wand, make you the emperor of the world just for a day. Can't kill anyone, so ixnay on that. You also can't put anyone in a re-education camp, so that can't happen either. But what you can do is we're going to give you a magic microphone that you're going to speak two things into it, and you're going to incept those ideas in the minds of every human on this planet. They're going to wake up the next day, whenever their next day is, and these two things are going to be at the top of their mind, and they're going to think they thought of it, and they're going to go and start doing that. What do you got for me? You know, I I knew this question was coming because I've listened to enough of your podcasts to know that this question was coming. Um, I did. I thought of one thing, and I hate to make it be one instead of two because you're the boss of this podcast. But I couldn't think of anything after I thought of this one because I think it's it's definitely number one front and center right now for me. Uh, just thinking about and reflecting on it, and it's it's pretty simple. It sound it might sound corny, but you know whenever you think something good or positive to say it, mm. that, like that's it. And I know it's again, getting back to negativity, it's like, there's so many negative things all around us. You're thinking negative thoughts and you're so prone to just let that come out of your mouth. And so there's very few times I find where I, or I think a lot of positive things, but I just don't say it or I don't tell the person, um, you know, and that could be, you know, when you think about, wow, my wife is beautiful today. You know, or, you know, I, my kids, they're great. I should tell them I love them, but you just don't actually say it to even whether it's colleagues or your boss that did a great job on something where you just, you were thinking it, but you didn't say it. And it's something I've been trying to do over the last year or two is every time I think something good to actually say it. And I think, if, and I fail at that every day, you know, but I think if people would do that. And if I would continue to do that and do it more, I think it'd be amazing just how that would impact the relationships in your life from business to family, to everything. Um, just that momentum that would create in your what, life just by being more positive and letting people know those positive thoughts as soon as they just spark into your head to let them know. You know, that. You, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a buy because I love that one. That, that one alone, if, if, if everyone could, because again, I, I, I am absolutely in the same corner as you are, you know, you forget uh, you, you, sometimes you don't have enough time and sometimes like people that you love die and like you yeah. are just bereft of the fact that you didn't get a chance to tell them that you love them, to tell them how much they meant to you. And like that, I got on that kick a while ago too. And it's really, it's kind of transformational because people don't, you know, like a lot of people think, well, you know, I feel that way. No, they actually don't. And yeah, like, right, exactly. And 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 like hearing it is just like, man, thank you. I wow, where did that come from? And people are so like, you know, used to maybe like somebody's trying to get an edge on them or something. That that's so awful that like people like recoil a little bit when you say something really nice that was not uh, asked for, was not anticipated. Right. Makes people feel really absolutely great. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a it's just a power, powerful concept. I know it's one of the things that I need to work on is, you know, I'm, it kind of reflects from investment to life is I'm a very concentrated investor. 
you know, if there's turnover in a portfolio, I know that I'm probably going to sell some stocks that I own today, which is hard because I'm building relationships with the management teams of those companies. So it feels very transactional. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I know I'm marrying these companies and 80% of the time it's going to end in divorce. And it's just a negative mindset to go into it. And so it, I have to make sure that that type of, call it ruthlessness to some extent, that doesn't destroy empathy in my normal life to where everything yeah. is just black or white, black or white, black or white. And so, you know, I have to create these things in my life to where, hey, you know, every time I think my wife's awesome, I got to tell her I love her, you know, not just me thinking it or I should have said it. You know, I know I'm lacking in that and I need to express that more, you know, uh, so. I think, I think that's great. I mean, you know, it's a, we, we all, my friend, are works in progress. And um, like the, the illusion of, uh, or the metaphor of the canvas is the right one. And like, just a little bit better every day, right? And all of a yeah. sudden, like, yep. wow, how did that happen? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, yeah, that that is how that happened. How do uh, how do folks? I you're on Twitter. How do folks find the rest of your stuff? We'll put it all in the show notes. Yeah, um, you can find me on Twitter. My name is the handle Ian Castle. Uh, you can find me on microcapclub.com. Um, the website for um, the capital management firm is if.capital. Uh, that's the name of the website there. And uh, just like you said, Jim, I, I always have clothes to new investors on there just so the right people would self-select in. So it's like, I never even have to. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. But uh, yeah, that's how you Thank get in you. contact with me. Thank you so much. 